Happy Easter, everyone. This is the virtual sermon for Easter 2022. Thanks for tuning in. While Easter may be the prominent feature of spring, the first real harbinger of winter's end is March Madness, right? The NCAA tournament. Um, Easter is also a celebration of uh, the plight of the underdog, which we'll talk about today. Uh, this year's March Madness uh, gave us the perfect underdog story to springboard off of. Uh, while Kansas may have won this year's NCAA tournament, uh, there was one team that stole the show and one particular player who benefited more than anyone else. And most of you know who I'm talking about. Uh, the number 15 seed, St. Peter's Peacock, Peacocks from Jersey City, New Jersey, rolled into the tournament this year. They started their season off 3-6. and six. They faced number 2 seed Kentucky in the first round. UK was favored by 18 points. Kentucky was a favorite by many to uh, win the whole tournament. Um, the mighty Peacocks won that game against Kentucky. Then they won again, and then they became the first 15 seed to ever reach um, the Elite Eight. It was an incredible run. But within that team was one specific player who rose to fame, Doug Eddert. He was unheard of. As of last week, though, even though he was unheard of in February, as of last week, as I'm standing here, you could type Doug into a Google search. And his name is now the first suggestion. Through his play in the tournament uh, and his signature mustache, he became a kind of mascot for the team. Barstool Sports got first dibs on a line of clothing they called Dougie Buckets. BW3 um, chose him, hired him. Uh, to endorse their wings during the tournament. His Twitter and social media um, blew up. Like, it went from just a few followers to a blue check verified Twitter account by the end of their four-game run in March Madness. What an incredible underdog story. There's always something captivating about someone's rise or an entire team or company. Their rise from nothing to glory or just success. We love it. Well, this being Easter, um, it's a celebration of the down and out rising up, literally and figuratively, right? Uh, baked into the resurrection story, um, we find underdogs from all walks of life. Everyone can re relate with at least one of them. And these underdogs were radically transformed by the resurrection. And I think we can find transformation through the resurrection of Jesus in our own lives as well. To really appreciate the fullness of uh, resurrection, we're invited uh, to identify with a character central to the resurrection story and central to the ministry of Jesus, but who is often left out because of our culture. Uh, the very fact that she is left out often of the telling of the story uh, gives us great insight into the power uh, of hope of the resurrection story. So let's talk for a minute about um, Mary Magdalene. Um, she becomes a kind of a, a source of hope for us in the midst of our disappointment. So Luke 8 introduces Mary into the story with this. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, his wife of Chusa. The manager of Herod's household, Susanna. And many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now, this is very interesting. It's a very interesting detail for Luke to include. First, well, most books are written these days with about one chapter's worth of material and 90% filler stuff. In the ancient world, every inch of parchment was precious and only the most important details were included. If they were in there, they were in there for a reason. Also, much of the material um, was written to be committed to memory. 
in an age without printing presses or literacy. So the details um, that were included were considered of utmost importance. Now, second thought is that in the ancient world, one would typically leave out embarrassing facts like women were the patrons of someone's public presence. I'm saying that in the ancient world, not today, because women had little social clout in Jesus' day. The fact that one of these women was formerly possessed by multiple demons, that's a detail included. That would have been extra scandalous. Luke wants us to know and appreciate that Jesus allowed women to have significant roles in his life and ministry. He also wants us to know that Mary Magdalene, a woman who was once far from God so far um, that she had seven demons inhabiting her body, she's a part of the story. Now, when ancient listeners <clears throat> took in a story, they would interact with all the elements of the story and mine every word and thought for significance. This was especially true of an ancient Jewish audience. So let's think for a minute about how Jesus changed Mary's life. Before Jesus, Mary was the underdog of society as a woman and more so in a hyper-religious society, what do you think her standing would have been in the world? Um, Demon-possessed woman. Even today, if a person was suspected to be possessed by multiple demons, there's some stigma there, right? Imagine uh, what it would have been like in a society that was based almost entirely around faith and rules. So let's empathize with Mary before um, she met Jesus. She was a lost soul uh, in every sense of the word. She was the ultimate underdog and outcast. Uh, no one would have been comfortable around her. She had limited opportunities to help herself out. Um, she was a real person, so I'm sure she felt like a loser, like a reject. There wasn't much hope for her life before she met Jesus, though. Can anyone relate? Maybe you can connect with her plight. The scriptures say that, that we all have some things in common with Mary. Apart from Jesus, our souls are lost and without hope. We have a lot more in common with Mary than what we might think. Ephesians 2 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live uh, when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. That's what uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, that's what he says. He's writing, and we'll look at a minute at the second half of what he writes there, but we can't appreciate the good stuff without understanding how bad things are without Jesus. We can't appreciate resurrection without understanding death. Paul says that we are spiritually dead because of our sin. We make bad moral choices. We um, um, harbor and run with terrible thoughts about people. We all do it. All it takes is one mean look from a driver after I did something dumb on the road and, and I'll return that look with an inner monologue that would make a sailor blush with shame. Um, we do things to harm people. We upgrade the guacamole while others die in poverty. We buy things we don't need. We're indifferent to suffering. Doesn't sound good, but it's us. Paul even calls out um, the spirit that is at work with disobedience. Was at work in us as well when we do those things. Essentially, Paul says, Mary was influenced by demons, so are we. We are spiritually dead from our own actions. That's just a spiritual fact. Mary was there. Then she met Jesus. Then Jesus cleansed her soul and gave her new life and new hope and new purpose. Can you even imagine what it must have felt like for Mary to know that Jesus chose her to support and play a role in his ministry? Imagine the sense of like healthy pride that would have uh, uh, welled up, that, that that would have given her. Then Jesus was arrested and crucified. Can you imagine her heartbreak? Um, she put her hope in him. She put uh, her hope in the identity that he gave her, and now he was dead. Back to square one. Uh, her dreams were dead as well. So was her source of identity. It was all for naught. Mary was lost again. 
And then God flipped the script. Look at how Luke tells the resurrection story. So he had already, you know, given the details before. Um, but these are the details that he wants us to put together knowing Mary's story. So this is Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day he'll be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So a group of women are the first to know about the resurrection. The angels uh, could have found the disciples and told them. Uh, instead, the message was first spread through women that Jesus was alive. Luke goes on to tell specifically who those women were. I love this part. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the, and, uh, and the others with them who told this to the disciples. So Luke had specifically told us about Mary and Joanna earlier in his account. It was, uh, it was the women uh, and the woman who uh, was once possessed by seven demons uh, who had lost her identity uh, in hope entirely when Jesus died, uh, she was the first to hear about his resurrection. Guess what? Jesus was also uh, first uh, to share with her uh, specifically. She was the first human to speak with the risen Jesus. Uh, here are uh, a few sound bites from John chapter 20. She, Mary Magdalene, turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but he did not, uh, she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them um, that he had said these things to her. Mary was the first human being to announce that she had seen the resurrected Lord. What an incredible honor God chose for her. Uh, God saw uh, the lost soul, he saw the ultimate underdog, and he turned it all around through Jesus. Then with the death of Jesus, Mary uh, once again was lost and without hope. And God turned it all around again for Mary, this time for all eternity. Now her story is told and celebrated everywhere the resurrection is celebrated. This is the power of the Easter story. Mary was the ultimate example of how God, um, of what God offers to all of us. God loves to flip the script of our life. The resurrection is the proof and the example. God became flesh and died. And then he was raised to life again. It was so humans could understand um, what it means to be God. That is uh, what God is like. That's what God does. Resurrection is the primary activity of God. We read, uh, we read earlier in Ephesians 2 that Paul said, we are all spiritually dead. It's a spiritual reality. It's pretty low stuff, pretty depressing stuff. Well, here's how Paul finishes the thought. Still from Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, so we were dead, but because of his great love for us, God in his rich mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
Jesus died on the cross for two reasons. <clears throat> to pay the price for your sins. And God also wanted you to see the death penalty being paid for uh, on your behalf. Jesus was raised to life for two reasons. To prove that he really was who he said he was, the Savior of the world. And secondly, to show you that one day uh, you will be raised to life as well. This new hope, this resurrection, is available to everyone who puts their hope in the saving power of Jesus. Hope for every single underdog. It's all available to you because Jesus is alive. It's all yours um, because he lives. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for everyone tuned in for this. And um, I'm grateful for your love for all of us. I'm grateful for the resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection, uh, not only because you triumphed and defeated death, but because through the resurrection, you show us that that's your path for us, that there's hope to turn even the darkest day into a new beginning through the resurrection. And we're grateful for that kind of love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter, everybody.